Well, good morning. Welcome back to the roundtable. Our tech guru, Jesse Filer, joins us this morning to talk about books and where they come from. So let's think about that. You know, as tech goes, when you think about the book, a lot of changes affecting readers, authors, and the people in the vast publishing world. And that means editors, designers, printers, agents, and many more. So we'll explore the new landscape of traditional publishing, indie publishing, print on demand, and self-publishing. Jesse Filer helps people and organizations get to know and use new technologies. He's the author of many books on computing. Most recently, he edited an, an updated edition of Uta Hagen's Respect for Acting, which he was uh, with us for just a few weeks ago. And we are thrilled to have him back as our tech guru. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Good to be back. It's wonderful to uh, to have you back. I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was through your experience of working on the Uta Hagen book that you started to think about what the, what the publishing world is and has become. Actually, that I've been interested in that all my life. Yeah. I've been interested in publishing all my life. And I've watched how things have changed. With the Uta book, I dealt with some specific issues there. Um, the books that I wrote, the technical books, <clears throat> showed me another side of publishing. Um, so I've seen all sorts of different parts of the publishing world, all of which have changed. So um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to just ask the obvious, you know, for the better? Um. Well, you see, that gets into <laughs> that gets into part of my my point of view of life. Oh, okay. Well, that yes, for the better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're uh, you're a glass half full kind of guy, then? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's, yeah. Why not? I mean, things are going to change. Uh, certain parts parts of the publishing world have not changed since Mr. Gutenberg started that nonsense with movable type. But um, other parts of it have changed a lot. And it's interesting. I know some people say it's terrible, but I re refuse to take part in those conversations because what are you going to do about it? Right. Uh, and, and there are some very good things that have happened. Well, one of the things is, is print on demand. And what does that, uh, and, and to me, that can mean two things, but I want to see if we're both on the same page there. So meaning that if we want to print something, if we've written something and we want to print it, we can do that, right? Basically, that's the idea. And then, but then also, if there are things that are out of print or are, are um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, are uh, in the public domain, mm -hmm. you can print those as well. Yeah. Basically, what happened, the whole idea of print on demand started from the idea that instead of publishers, instead of printing a few thousand copies of a book to be ready for when it went on sale, they would wait until they had orders for it and then would, instead of taking the books off a shelf and shipping them out to bookstores and people and so forth, instead of that, they would print the book on demand and it got got to a point where they were promising turnaround time. I remember at one point they were turning turnaround down of time of three days, which was it sounded pretty good. Right. Now it turns out that there's a lot of things that are done with print on demand. When you if you're if you are going into a physical bookstore where you can see the book, it's not print on demand because it's someone else demanded it. You could see the thing and put your hands on it right then and there. <clears throat> but when you are ordering, if you order for a book online and it says it will ship in two days, most likely it's print on demand. People just think that, you know, it takes time to find the book and so forth, uh, which some of that does happen. But uh, publishers and readers are getting used to the idea that they can order a book if it's not in stock in their local bookstore. They can order a book and get it within a few days. Right. Um, and that's where print-on-demand has come in. 
And what does that tell us about the reading habits of the public? Because I think there was a time when when you and I were talking fairly regularly on this on this segment many years ago that, well, will there be will there be books? Will there we're, we're, we have e-readers, we have all of this technology. I can pick up my phone, I can read whatever book I want right on that telephone. And uh, what we have found, um, go independent booksellers. Um, is is that people like books. They like to have something in their hand. And out of all of the technologies, that seems the book, the, the thing that you hold, seems to be the one that, that's held on. That is hold, held on. The To me, what's important is looking... And by the way, I put on the website, I put some numbers from Association of American Publishers, yes. which has a lot of information about this. JesseFiler.com, by the way. Yeah, more numbers than we could possibly deal with. Okay. <laughs> but, or want to. But um, the numbers that I think are most important for AAP, the numbers are most important is how much money they make. But the numbers that are most important are how many people are reading. Mm. Whether they are reading, um, whether they are reading a physical book, reading something on a device, and now that we're starting to see data that is coming in from people who are, in quotes, reading a book, using an audio book. Sure. So all of those. If I put my author's hat on now, yeah, all of those from an author's point of view are the same thing. Yeah, they all count. They all count. People are interacting with the book, right. with the ideas, the story, whatever, and that's what matters. And that's where the numbers are going up. Now, there are those weirdos out there. This is totally me, Jesse. Um, I, I like all of those technologies I, 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 and often we'll have all three mm -hmm. um, where I want to listen to it in the car. There's times where I'm in the I'm, I'm waiting for an appointment at, at the at the medical offices and they're, it's taking a little longer than I expected. And, and, you you know, you start reading your book. And then when I get home, I like to take the book out and just have it on my lap. So right. um, there are those uh, it, it, you almost find a hybrid of, of how people their habits of of what they like. What there's a number that I have been searching for and I don't know if anyone has it or will look at it is where people read. Mm -hmm. Or and and I'm using read in the broadest sense right. including audiobooks. Um if you got I go into New York City that is um about at least once a month and in New York City <clears throat> it's very clear that there are two groups of people when it comes to reading or consuming books. And um, it's, there's, you can say they're the people who read the audio books, they hold the books. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is the people who are reading a book in a car or a, in a car as opposed to on a bus or a subway. Mm -hmm. And that's a big difference between those two activities. Uh, and I have a feeling that the audiobooks are bigger for the the listeners, not surprisingly. Um, I don't know how many people are switching or picking up, as you said, they would listen to chapter one yeah. and then read chapter two on paper or a device. And so I don't know how many people are doing that. Yeah, I probably a, not many. I have a feeling that <laughs> mo most people probably – determine the the device or the yeah. medium that they are reading from by where they are. That's right. And and, and you're absolutely right. And I do that too. So I'll have a, a, a car book, I'll have a, a home book, and then I'll have like a subway book. Are they the same book? No. No. Because <laughs> because you know you're going to be reading it in a certain place. Yeah. And that's the kind of book you want to read. Now, um, the the idea of your options with a book, of reading a book, of writing a book, of publishing a book, and and really, all of those have been impacted in one way or another by the technology and technology, the technologies we've been dis discussing, but just technology in general. Yes, everything is changing. Um, and can I give another reference? Uh, please, because. Authors Guild, which is the uh, American group uh, supporting authors, mm -hmm. it's a nonprofit. It 
does. They have a wonderful several books about publishing for authors, and there's a, all the information I could give is is there, but um, it's changing it, and people are realizing, on the one hand, that they have a great idea for a book, and in the past, people who had a great idea for a book would say, I wish I could get it published. And now it turns out that people can publish those books. And the reason I brought up Authors Guild is one of the things they have is a big uh, section about how you can self-publish books, including a new article that I noticed was just published about publishing scams. Because lo and behold, it's very easy to publish a book if you know what you're doing. And lo and behold, people who are nefarious <laughs> have decided that they will help people publish books. Uh, please send us some money and we'll help publish this book and you'll make a fortune. So you have to be very careful with that. Uh, Jesse Filer is with us this morning. We are talking about books and uh, technology and the technology of books. I okay, so I I could possibly get myself in trouble here. So I will. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> May I help? Uh, yeah, absolutely. You can help. I need you. I need your help. So I mean, I think. Look, I have people come up to me all the time and say, um, "Oh, I do what you do." And, and I said, oh, what is, what is that? And they said, well, I have a podcast. And I said, oh, that's great. You know, that's, that's great. And um, meaning anyone who wants to have a radio show can have a radio show. They can mm -hmm. do a podcast. They can get the, the equipment very cheaply or just do it on their phone right. and put it out. And, and, and it's, it is distributed and people have access to it. Now, um, I would like to think that what we do here is different than what is done in podcasting. Our show, this show, this segment is will be podcast, so people have an opportunity. But we have, you know, we have a radio station behind it. There's mm -hmm. there are people. There are yes. <laughs> there's a whole machine behind that, uh, so that here again you have like publishers. You have the access. You have the opportunity of listening to it live. You have the opportunity of streaming it, or they have the opportunity of hearing it later um, via a, a podcast. So um, and and. But what? <laughs> but what does the the regulation then, or the self regulation of, of self publishing? Uh, people will come up to me and they say, "Oh, I've written fourteen books," and you and and I can't believe you've never had me on your show. You have to be on your show, and 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 then I read, and then I find out that you know maybe there's twenty copies of this book in 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 print. Um, it doesn't mean that they're not a real author, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, authors are not licensed. Yeah. If you say you're a chiropractor, if you're going to say that, you have to have some. It has a paper on the wall. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Um, that doesn't apply to authors, unless they happen to be chiropractors. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's it's not a licensed profession or I hate to call it a profession activity um, but are you are you trying to get at the idea of how do we know what's good and what isn't well what I'm trying to get at the idea is there's one of the things that seems to be missing from a lot of self-published books and that is the uh, the editing process the development process um, proofreading um, any marketing plan uh, a anything that a normal book would have of whether it's from a major publisher from a small independent publisher or from a university publisher and those those are things that there is some degree, if you will, of a Better Homes and Gardens seal of approval that this has gone through yeah. the committee that has said this is, is where it doesn't mean you're not going to come across a bad book, of course. But what it does mean is, is that this has gone through um, a fairly rigorous process before it has hit the consumer. Absolutely. And that's, that's an issue. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm hopeful that it sort of sorts itself out. Because there are, first of all, when it comes to podcasts, 
there are numbers on those things. Right. And you can tell how many people are listening to them or are turning them on. And you can, you know, so that presents a certain amount of information about what's going on there. As to the quality of it, who knows? Uh, some people love to listen to really awful things. <laughs> In the podcast world, in the political world, right. you know, so there's no accounting for taste. And so we don't control that. But, um, yeah, that's one of the problems with self-publishing is anyone can do it. Uh, but And you talk about proofreading, which is one of the areas that really, really is difficult because people don't realize, you know, they get, they get someone whose brother was an English teacher uh, – to proofread a book, right. and that's usually not satisfactory. Although, of course, uh, have you read the New York Times lately? Yeah, this morning. How many proofreading errors did you find? <laughs> <laughs> you know, proofreading is a lost art. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. I and I, uh, my my mother, who was a, a reference librarian, um, and and she's been gone for many years, but um, I remember her telling me these stories of these people who would come in and their whole job was to find, uh, well, I shouldn't say job, their their thing was to go into encyclopedias and find errors and then circle them and bring them to the reference librarian mm. so that they would <laughs> they would be <laughs> updated. Uh, and uh, and sometimes I feel that same way when I'm reading, yeah, a newspaper where you, you say, oh, well, that's not the word they meant there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but it, it's... And uh, but proofreading is very difficult, and that's for myself. When I do things that I've self-published, I don't do covers and I don't do proofreading, because first of all, you can't proofread anything you've written. No, I mean, it just it doesn't matter whether whether it's a letter or whatever. Because you have the shorthand in your mind. Yes, and you sort of just look over yeah. whatever you've messed so, up. So, and I can do the inside of a book, but I can't do cover. Those are very specific skills. What is it um, in in the few moments that we have left when we think about that that technology of um, you know and even the even in what you were saying about the New York Times and and other newspapers as well um, and other publications that are are they relying on technology now are they relying on sort of a grammarly type thing that uh will go through and and say you know even though um i'm trying to think of a simple simple example but where, where one word is meant and obviously another word is acceptable even though it makes no sense when you read it but it does within the confines of the computer program is the question, do, are the newspapers like the Times doing that? If they are, they're not going to tell us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, because you wonder if that's why you see it so um, – it's so prevalent. Not that you haven't always seen it, but I – th I think part of it comes from the fact that for the um, – um, we haven't badmouthed teachers yet. In no. This segment. <laughs> okay. So we'll get – We've got three minutes, so go ahead. <laughs> That um, people, I want to say kids, but it's more than that, are not using the English language properly or as properly as they used to. Yeah. The, one of the things that is starting to bug me, and I think I've even caught this in the Times, is when in, in reporting something that a poly, someone has said and they present the quote – they are fixing what I would consider fixing the quote mm. to make it more grammatical. And some, I think the Times has even done this. When someone talks about what they're going to do, in print, it comes up as G O N N A. Gonna. I'm gonna go to the store. And I don't like that. But they haven't asked me. Going to go. <laughs> Is that yeah, you if you're going to the store. Yeah. I, it, going ends in ing, not nna. Yeah. But. Uh, and do we, and I assume that we are just at the, uh, in our final moment here, uh, that, that, our, that we're just at the tip of the iceberg uh, as AI and, and chat GPT and all these other technologies come to us as, as uh, quote unquote, AIDS 
assistances in in writing. Yeah, we're going to have to see how this plays out because I have a funny feeling that um, <laughs> I have a funny feeling that um, some AI has been used for years and is working beautifully. Yeah, some AI. Especially with voicemails, things and tell us, you know, I'm a, I'm an automated system. Right. Let me know what you want. Right. And some of that works brilliantly, and some of it is a disaster. So I think we're not ready to say that this is the next great thing. I'm not. Jesse Filer provides consulting services to small businesses and nonprofits. You can find information on the topics that we just discussed and other cool stuff at jessefiler.com. jessefiler.com. Jesse, always a pleasure having you with us. Thank you so much. Good to be.